The ancient kingdom was named after Luffy's dream, and its name is... By the end of the video, you'll have learned this true name of the ancient kingdom, and I think I accidentally solved it while I was rereading the Egghead arc and doing research for a Gear 5 video, when I suddenly realized something insane. Monkey D Dragon didn't have his tattoo until after becoming a revolutionary, and I think the reason he got it was because he, just like Vegapunk and Clover, figured out what the One Piece is. His tattoo is one of the biggest hints of the Void Century, and it all has to do with Skypiea. Also, have you ever noticed that Kuma's Bible has a sub? and wings on it. Seems pretty interesting, huh? Yet again, we see more references to the Sky People and the way this all connects to the One Piece is insane. Like, after putting all these pieces together, I legit had to just sit down in awe, thinking to myself, there's just no way Oda did this. Also, if you watched this video of mine, then I know you're gonna love this one as well, because I think I accidentally solved the One Piece again, and this whole entire theory perfectly goes along with that theory. I can't wait to show you guys everything. And now, getting into the first part of the theory, let me explain to you Dragon's morals that are connected with the One Piece. So, first off, we know that Dragon made his revolutionary army because of what happened at Ohara. He originally had the Freedom Fighters, which according to Vegapunk, were an impoverished military force. Now, the name of this original military is important because freedom is what the One Piece will accomplish and Dragon is already trying to do such a thing on his own. If this doesn't make much sense right now, trust me, you'll see what I mean in a few minutes. Okay, so now it seems like Dragon made his revolutionary army after the Ohara incident because he was so furious at the world government and he probably also realized that what the Oharans were looking into had to be true, since the government had to eradicate their mere existence. We even see Vegapunk tell Robin in that same chapter that although the Ancient Kingdom Void Century Ohara theory is only a theory, didn't the government basically prove it to be true when they wiped Ohara out? Also, notice how when talking about the Void Century, Frankie says, talk about a tale packed with romance and mystery. What a super thing to say, because he may be hinting that this tale is the Romance Dawn. However, we'll get more into this later when I reveal the true name of the Ancient Kingdom. Now, before we get into anything else, today's video is sponsored by Wonder. Wonder is an app that uses AI technology to turn your words into unique digital art. To do this, all you have to do is enter a prompt. For example, LeBron goes Super Saiyan, then you pick an art style, for example, Anime Man, and then wait for the magic to happen. Click the link in the description to download Wonder and to get a free trial of the Lifetime Premium version to put your creativity to the test. The Premium includes 20 plus more styles, it works faster, it allows unlimited art, it has no ads, high resolution images, and it allows 50% off on your AI avatar. If you want to test your creativity, then I highly recommend using Wonder because after only using it for two days, I'm already addicted to it. It's just so much fun. I mean, just take a look at some of these pictures I made. Wonder makes Nami in real life. Mike Tyson as an anime character and Luffy as a monkey looks so detailed. Now remember, if you want to do the same, then click the link in the description to download Wonder and get the free trial of the premium version. Okay, so going back to Dragon, since we see that Vegapunk solved the name of the Ancient Kingdom by reading the text, I'd only assume that Dragon would have done the same. I mean, he was literally there with Vegapunk, and he was the one who actually told Vegapunk about who the giants were. He was the one who actually met Saul while at Ohara. Now, if Dragon actually did learn the name of the Ancient Kingdom by reading what Ohara left him, wouldn't Oda have foreshadowed this? Well, yes actually, and what if I told you that Oda foreshadowed it from the very first time we see Dragon? I mean, he's literally introduced with Roger's iconic quote, these things cannot be stopped, an inherited strength of will, one's dreams, the ebb and flow of the ages, as long as people hunger for freedom, these things will exist. So the man who found the One Piece said these words on his deathbed, and it seems like he was trying to tell the world something with this. We also learned that Dragon was at Roger's death, hiding himself in a hoodie, which may show that what he does is also inspired by Roger. And now, it really seems like this quote from Roger was in fact about the One Piece and all the ancient history stuff, since he brings up Will, which may be referencing the Will of D, Dreams, which I believe to be connected to the ancient kingdom, I'll explain why later, and of course, people's hunger for freedom, which is most definitely tied to the ancient kingdom. Now, you may think, well, how is freedom so important to the mystery of the ancient kingdom? Well, in case you forgot, Vegapunk literally describes this exact quote, except he replaces the idea of freedom 
with Nika. Notice how Vegapunk says, but as long as people wish for him, his existence will never truly disappear. Isn't this basically identical to as long as people hunger for freedom, these things will exist? And isn't Luffy literally the warrior of liberation, or in other words, the warrior of freedom? We also see that when Husu describes the sun god, he claims that slaves and prisoners would pray to the legendary warrior who they believed would one day free them. Another thing Vegapunk says is that all things are brought into this world with hope and in case you forgot, Luffy was also called the Warrior of Hope back in Thriller Bark. This shows that he is not only the embodiment of freedom, but also the embodiment of hope, which is what people rely on when they hunger for freedom. Now, going back to Roger's quote, if he was talking about the sun god Nika here, then we can assume that this whole quote was about stuff from the ancient kingdom, and is it really a coincidence that Dragon was introduced with it? I think that even from this chapter, Oda was telling us that Dragon knows what Roger was really talking about, and also that Dragon's whole belief system revolves around these words. There's even more to this which ties in with the ancient kingdom which has to do with the part on dreams. However, before I get into that, let's go back into how Dragon knows what Roger knew and how he figured it out. I think there's a few ways he could have learned about the sun god Nika and the ancient kingdom. The main way is by him going to Elbaf and learning everything that Vegapunk learned from the Ohara books. Another way he could have learned is potentially through Clover when Clover was still alive. If Dragon didn't learn through these two ways, then the final way would be that maybe Vegapunk just told him everything that he learned. I honestly see one of the first two options being more likely since we know Dragon really cares about the Ohara incident. And on top of this, I also think that there's a good chance that Dragon always knew Luffy was Joy Boy and the sun god Nika. I feel like one way he could have learned this is by Shanks telling him that he thinks his son is Joy Boy. Shanks seems to tell literally everyone about Luffy, for example, Mihawk and Ray Lee, so it surprised me if he didn't meet with the very father of the boy that he gave his straw hat to. Another thing is that, although we don't technically know if Shanks knew what the Gumma Gumma Nome truly was at the time when Luffy ate it, I'm gonna say there's a good chance that he he did know, and if he did, he could have convinced Dragon that his son will become the legendary sun god Nika. I feel like at least by now, Dragon should know of Luffy's true nature, since all he'd have to do to figure it out is look at his current bounty poster. Now, if Dragon did learn that Luffy ate the Gumma Gumma specifically, he could have realized with the help of Vegapunk that Luffy might be Joy Boy. I mean, Dragon was also one of the people who witnessed Luffy smile right as he was about to die, which was only done by no other than the legend himself. Goal D. Roger. Remember that Dragon also witnessed that execution, so he may have thought to himself the same thing that Smoker thought, which was that Luffy is a whole lot like Roger. If he realized this, then he may have also thought that Luffy will be the one to carry on Roger's will and bring the freedom that he spoke of. And now you may ask, well, why does any of this matter? Why does Dragon, knowing that Luffy is Joy Boy, even matter? Well, it's important because remember, Roger also talked about someone who will even surpass him, and if Dragon saw what Luffy is, then he may have come to the conclusion that his own son will be the legendary Joy Boy that the ancient people have been waiting for. Roger also probably learned at Laugh Tale that the sun god Nika will return and free the world, and if Roger knew about that, then I'd also expect Dragon to have learned about it from the ancient manuscripts that Ohara researched. If he knows Luffy is Joy Boy, then he already solved a part of the One Piece mystery, which is the mystery of who would become the return of Joy Boy. Also, Dragon's freedom fighters were also most likely inspired from the sun god Nika or Roger's legendary quote, or possibly even both. I'll explain more about the evidence of exactly how he found the truth about Nika later, but for now, just understand that Dragon definitely knows about it. It almost seems like Dragon actually knows his son is special when he says things like, Luffy, there are times in history when it takes a will such as yours, together with chance and coincidence, to make people question the world. The day will come when we shall meet. Is he trying to say that he knows Luffy is Joy Boy since he knows that Luffy has the ability to naturally make people question the world. We also see that Dragon always looks out to the distant east, and it's hinted that whenever he does this, it's because he's thinking about Luffy, and this shows that he actually does care about his son. However, for an unexplained reason, he isn't allowed to meet him just yet. If Dragon always knew Luffy was Nika, then it may explain why he usually doesn't show much interest in him, because he may be like, yeah, I already know Luffy will perform his duty in freeing the world, now I need to make sure that I do too. When he finally meets Luffy, they will probably bring freedom to the whole world together since Luffy is the literal warrior of liberation while Dragon is the guy who is gathering people who have the will to fight for freedom. Together, 
They will bring what the One Piece said will happen to the world. Dragon also practically made an army that represents the Ancient Kingdom since it seems to revolve around the ideals of the Sun God Nika. Just like how his friend Vegapunk is trying to bring back the technology of the ancient times, Dragon is trying to bring back the beliefs and way of life of the ancient times. He probably always had the will to do such a thing considering that he is a part of the D Clan. However, I still think he received a lot of his philosophies from researching things connected to the One Piece. And now, with all this being said, this all shows only some of Dragon's knowledge knowledge on the true history and now let's go to something else he figured out which is the name of the ancient kingdom and its connection to Luffy. Okay so basically every single line that I've brought up describing freedom or in other words Nika there's always been another word that's been brought up around it. This word would be dream. The first time we see dragon Goldie Rogers quote says that one's dreams could not be stopped as long as people hunger for freedom. Vegapunk says that every devil fruit is a possibility for human evolution that someone desired. Or in other words, every devil fruit is a possibility for human evolution that someone dreamed. He then speaks on how people would dream to be like this or dream to be like that, which ultimately led to the devil fruit's creation. After this, he says that those with devil fruit powers exist in different dimensions dreamed up by someone else before them. And okay, so now you may say, well, what's the point of dreams and what does it have to do with the name of the ancient kingdom? Well, the reason it's important is because I believe it literally is the name of the ancient kingdom since Oda seemed to foreshadow that the ancient kingdom's name was Necrara, which in English is called Dreamland or Island of Dreams. Now, why do I specifically think that this island is the ancient kingdom? Well, first of all, on the cover page that we learn of this legendary island, we see that Mont Blanc and his monkey friends are the ones trying to find it. If you go back to the very end of Skypiea, you'll see that after hearing Luffy ring the golden bell, Mont Blanc and the monkeys come to the conclusion that they're gonna chase after another adventure next. Since they realize that the city of gold is real, they probably realize that other islands only known through legend also had to be real. If they're searching for an island that many theorize to not even exist, then wouldn't Nakrara being the ancient kingdom just make sense? The biggest hint to Nakrara being the ancient kingdom is the fact that in this cover page, we literally see a monkey wearing a straw hat. Just like how a monkey wearing a straw hat is carrying the will of the ancient kingdom and is gonna be the one to either find the ancient kingdom, bring its philosophies and ideals back, or both. Now, if the ancient kingdom's name really is Dreamland, then that would make Vegapunk's and Roger's quotes hit differently since they were basically hinting at what the ancient kingdom was. I also believe the kingdom was called that because it was a land where anyone could do anything or in other words, a place which merely felt like a dream. I mean, they were able to create devil fruits which were abilities that humans always dreamt of achieving, so who knows what else the land of dreams could accomplish. Also remember that Professor Clover says that the very existence and idea of this kingdom is in fact what the world government finds so threatening. If the existence of a dreamland ended up being known as a part of history, who wouldn't want to live in such a world? Who wouldn't want to live in a place where all your dreams could come true? Another thing Clover and Vegapunk confirmed was that you can learn the name of this kingdom through ancient manuscripts and although I don't think Mont Blanc and his monkey friends realized the importance of this island, I do believe they found about its legend through some sort of ancient book or fairy tale that also had the city of gold in it. The whole idea of them searching for it is honestly kind of ironic since Luffy will most likely be the one to find it first and show them its existence. This is just like how he beat them to the punch of finding the city of gold. And if the ancient kingdom's name really is Dreamland or Nakrara, what other reason could it be named that other than the fact that they had the technology to make dreams come true? Well, we also know that this kingdom symbol was most likely a sun with eight rays or eight circles surrounding it since we continuously see the symbol in islands associated with the ancient kingdom. And with this, we could only assume that the sun god was the most important piece of it, right? Well, what if I told you that this kingdom even named themselves after the sun god Nika himself? Now, you may wonder, how does Dream land come from Luffy or from Nika? Well, it comes from it since the sun god Nika's powers are literally the power of dreams. The Gorosei describe the sun god Nika fruit to only be limited by the user's imagination or the user's ability to dream. Luffy also describes his awakening as having the power to finally do everything he ever wanted to do, or in other words, everything that he's ever dreamed of doing. Both of these quotes prove that the warrior of liberation has the powers of making dreams become a reality in the physical world. We also see Luffy's power for ourselves and I 
think everyone can admit that he literally has the powers that you'd see in your dreams. Luffy or Nika is also the one who's built around dreams since he's making everyone's dreams come true. We see this is true when the Straw Hats claim their dreams as they enter the Grand Line. Also, Luffy's dream seems to be something that can only happen after he becomes the Pirate King or after he finds the One Piece, which was probably also the original Joy Boy's dream and is probably a thing that the Ancient Kingdom also wanted for the world. Luffy's true dream is most likely connected to the Ancient Kingdom and it may even be connected to why they named it Dreamland. Who knows, Luffy's dream may even be the Ancient Kingdom or at least something that they did. If we also consider the fact that Blackbeard and Luffy are two sides of the same coin, then what if their dreams are also two sides of the same coin? Preach was the one who told me this idea and it honestly does make a lot of sense. So in recent chapters, Blackbeard says that his dream is to create his own Blackbeard Kingdom and to be the king of it. If this is Blackbeard's dream, then what if Luffy's dream is to also make his own sort of kingdom or to have his own island? Luffy's would would probably be similar to Blackbeard's in the case where they both don't have any rules and where they both allow criminals to roam. However, Luffy's would be a peaceful island where everyone's friends. Luffy's or Joy Boy's kingdom would also most likely be the funnest place to live since literally all Luffy wants to do is have fun. It would also be the exact opposite of what the Celestial Dragons rule. I mean, even down to the ruler, just like how Emu is the king of the world, Luffy would be the complete opposite since he wouldn't rule or conquer anything. He'd just continue to live freely, just like how he always has, even with the kingdom that's revolved around him. It'd be really neat to see if the ending of One Piece has a pirate paradise that is like the ancient kingdom, but even better. I mean, I'd only expect Luffy to make an even better version of the previous ancient kingdom, since he is the main character. Now, going back to Blackbeard, is it also a coincidence that Blackbeard was the one to tell Luffy about dreams? This may have been the ultimate foreshadow from Oda that their dreams are also two sides of the same coin. Now, this quote is very important to the entire story and theme of One Piece since dreams are the exact reason for every character's motivation. It seems like even Luffy himself only really wants to become Pirate King to accomplish his dream. Overall, dreams give people hope will, something to live for, and even something to die for. The highest celestial dragons know this, which is why they intend to crush people's dreams. Another reason dreams are so important is because without people believing in such things, like the One Piece, no one would ever find it. For example, someone like Bellamy could never become the Pirate King or do anything spectacular in any regard, simply because he used to not even believe that the Sky Island or One Piece exists. He even makes fun of pirates who dream and end up dying doing what they love. Luffy, on the other hand, being the embodiment of a true dreamer, thinks Bellamy's just a fool and not even worth his time. Now, this quote made by Bellamy, which is, the age of pirates who dream is over, the city of gold, the emerald city, the one piece, fools whose eyes are clouded by the treasures of their dreams will never seize the real gains right below their noses. Now, is it really a coincidence that Oda talks about the relocations or things that are connected to the ancient kingdom as being fake realities and just false dreams. And by the way, I know we haven't seen the Emerald City yet, but if you want to know for a fact that it's connected to the Ancient Kingdom, then check out my God Valley video after this one. Now, in this quote, Oda is basically telling us that these three things all seem so ridiculous that they sound like dreams, however, they actually exist. In fact, maybe that could also be how Dreamland got its name. Maybe Nekrara got its name because it seemed like something straight from a dream. It didn't even seem real. I mean, at the end of Skypiea, the name the narrator even states that the sky that you see when you look upon a whim, is it a dream? Is it real? The country of the Kami above the clouds. Even the narrator asks if the Skypiea arc was a dream or if it was even real. I think Oda put this to tell us that the adventure in the sky merely felt like a dream and since it's connected to the ancient kingdom, we could also assume that their entire kingdom was the same, especially with all the ridiculous technologies. Oda also goes out of his way to confirm to us that the One Piece is real when multiple characters say it. He does this because he has to remind even us that it does exist. Whitebeard also said those words because of the new age of piracy that was starting to not believe in such things. Bellamy makes it clear that there's a lot of new pirates that don't believe in things like the One Piece, which means that Whitebeard most likely said it to inspire a whole new generation to dream just like his generation did. Dreaming is also very important when it comes to the sun god Nika because believing in his existence gives people hope. We know this is true because when describing the sun god Nika, who's who says, did he exist or did they dream him up? 
They thought he'd bring smiles to their faces and deliver them from suffering. He's basically telling us that the sun god Nika's existence almost seems too good to be true. Almost as if he seems like something that people could only dream about. That's honestly the whole point. The sun god Nika and ancient kingdom are things that seem too good to be true, which is why many people don't believe in them. That's also probably why the celestial dragons had to erase them from history because they know that their existences would impact a world rebellion because they provide a reality that literally every Everyone wants deep down. They provide the resources to allow people's dreams to come true and they also allow true freedom. And remember how earlier I stated that in every quote that we see the word freedom or Nika, we also see dream being in Rogers and Vegapunk's quotes? Well yet again, we see these words all tied together except this time it's all three. This time we see Nika, the word free, and dream all within the same dialogue. This may be yet another hint that the kingdom connected to Nika and to his liberation was named after dreams. And now now, something else that may have foreshadowed that the Ancient Kingdom is based off of Luffy, yet again has to do with the Nekrara cover page. So if the Ancient Kingdom's name really is Nekrara, then what if the monkey with the straw hat in this picture is meant to foreshadow that Nekrara is based on a monkey that wears a straw hat, the dream of a monkey that wears a straw hat, or who knows, maybe even both. On top of this, I also do think it's connected to something else that Luffy has dreamed of having, which is a bronze statue. If you watched my last tale video, then you already know that I believe that there's a bronze statue of a monkey that wears a straw hat at Laugh Tail, and that I also believe that the Ancient Kingdom created this along with another statue of the original Joy Boy, which is also at Laugh Tail. The way I believe they knew about Luffy's existence is from looking into the future through something that resembles Shirley's crystal ball. There's honestly a lot of foreshadowing to this being a part of the One Piece treasure, but I'll only go over a few points to make it quick. So in Skypea, there's a chapter titled Finale, and I believe that this chapter is meant to foreshadow the finale of One Piece, or basically, what's at Laugh Tale. The first way it foreshadows a statue being at Laugh Tale is the fact that it starts out with the Shandians talking to the Kalgara statue, saying that the sacred duty of the Shandians has been fulfilled. Isn't this just like how when Luffy finds Laugh Tale and possibly the statue of the original Joy Boy, the sacred duty of the Will of D will have been fulfilled. The next foreshadow of the One Piece having something to do with statues is that at the very end of the chapter, we yet again see another statue. However, this one seems to be one from the Void Century. It seems to be since Sanji brings up how the trees in Upper Yard seem to be a thousand years old. And since Oda is trying to tell us that the trees are that old, we can only assume that the statues around the trees are also a thousand years old. I'll explain later on in the video how this statue is connected to the original Joy Boy. But for now, just understand that this is the second statue we see in the chapter title finale. The third hint of a statue of Joy Boy being at the One Piece is the fact that Luffy says that the one thing he wants to buy with the money from all the gold they stole is a gigantic bronze statue. In a way, I think this is a part of Luffy's dream, and the reason I think this is because it shows what Luffy truly wants. With all the money in the world, the one thing he wants is a bronze statue. And now, to prove to you that this bronze statue won't be built after he finds the One Piece, but will have actually already been built, let's take a look at one more tiny detail in this chapter. So the chapter ends with the golden bell ringing and the narrator talking about the bell showing its importance. Now you may wonder, well, what is this bell? have to do with Luffy and more importantly a statue of Luffy. Well if you take a close look at the golden bell you'll notice that engraved on it is literally a monkey with a straw hat. This proves that they did know about Luffy's future existence and on top of that it shows that they were even willing to make physical things of him which proves that they definitely could have made a statue of him. If we want to look at the cover page that has Nekara in it even another time maybe this picture could also foreshadow that the ancient kingdom had a statue of a monkey with a straw hat, just like how the cover page has it. They probably put Luffy on the golden bell and possibly even created a statue of him to honor him since they knew that he's the one that's going to ultimately defeat the celestial dragons and truly change the world. They probably also wanted to honor him since he's the guy who's going to bring the ancient kingdom back together. And more evidence to the ancient kingdom being created due to the sun god is this fact that Luffy's the one bringing it back together. Just like how he's gonna bring Fishman Island, Alabasta, Wano, Shandora, Amazon Lily, and Zoe together, the original Joy Boy probably brought everyone together in his time. 
He was probably the rope linking all men, just like how Luffy is. And because of this, they may have named the kingdom after both of them or based it off of them as a tribute to their mere existence. The parallels with the ancient kingdom and the sun god Nika also makes it seem very likely that they have the same exact ideals and that they correspond with each other. Just like how Professor Clover claims that the mere existence of that kingdom and its ideals is what the world government finds so threatening, it's also the exact same thing with the sun god Nika. The ancient kingdom was erased from history and the sun god Nika was also erased from history. The world government killed anyone who had knowledge of this kingdom at Ohara, just like how they attempted to kill anyone with knowledge on Nika when they tried to kill Who's Who and when the prison guard that told Who's Who about Nika mysteriously vanished. The name of the ancient kingdom vanished from history, just like how the name of the Hitohito Hito Nomi, modern Nika Devil Fruit, vanished from history. Just like how the ancient kingdom is the key to the threat of the world government, the sun god Nika is also the key to the threat of the world government. Maybe, just maybe, the ideals of the ancient kingdom that the world government fears are the same exact ideals of the sun god Nika. Maybe they even got their ideals from him. I find this very likely considering that Nika directly opposes them and that they chose to completely erase these two things from history right after the void century happened. These ideals most likely revolve around freedom and dreams, which is the exact thing that I've been talking about this whole time. The ideals of freedom that the ancient kingdom received through Joy Boy are the same exact ideals that Dragon received from the ancient kingdom and Nika as well. Something interesting that I found connecting the ancient kingdom with Nika is that if you say these same sentences that Clover said but replace kingdom with Nika, it somehow per Perfectly fits. For example, after reading ancient manuscripts and the few poneglyphs that have been found, we've gradually discovered the existence of a man which no trace now remains. Or maybe history will reveal that the very existence and idea of this man is in fact what the world government finds so threatening, isn't that so? We still don't know the nature of this threat, but the key is the man that once lived and his name was only to be shot right before Saiyan Nika or Sun God Nika. Another interesting connection with the Ancient Kingdom and the Sun God Nika has to do with Mont Blanc Cricket once again. Back in Jaya, he was the one who told Luffy what romanticism means, which is the mere mystery and fantasy that such a thing as a city of gold exists in the sky. This is connected to the Ancient Kingdom because remember, Frankie describes the story of the Ancient Kingdom being erased from history as a tale packed with romance and mystery. Is it really a coincidence that the tale of the Ancient Kingdom is described as one with romance, just like how Cricket was the one who told Luffy about romanticism and who later may have revealed the name of the ancient kingdom on his search for it. Remember, he's also the guy who would want to search for romantic and mysterious islands since he was always looking for the city of gold. Now, to connect this all back to Luffy and Nika, yet again proving that the ancient kingdom may have been based off of Nika, where else have you heard the word romance when it comes to One Piece? Well, maybe in the very first volume, which is titled Romance Dawn. Also, in case you didn't know, Oda was even planning on calling One Piece Romance Dawn before coming to the conclusion of One Piece. Now, what does this have to do with Luffy, you may say? Well, Luffy is the sun god, and the dawn is the first appearance of light, or the first appearance of the sun before sunrise, so wouldn't it just make sense that Oda wanted to call One Piece Romance Dawn, because it's a story of the sun god that's full of romance. Also, the dawn is something that is continuously brought up in One Piece, and it seems like the dawn will come at the very end of the story, which makes me believe that it has something to do with Luffy, or more importantly, Luffy's dream. Who knows, Luffy's dream may even be the dawn, since he's the sun god, which means he's the one who will bring the dawn. And now, to tie this all back with Cricket and the Ancient Kingdom even more, if you take a look at the cover page of the very chapter that Cricket tells Luffy what romanticism is, the sun is rising, or in other words, it's literally the dawn, yet again connecting romance with the dawn, showing that the story of romance, or the story of the Ancient Kingdom, is directly tied with the dawn. Now, if you still don't think this is enough to explain the truth of the Ancient Kingdom's name and of its purpose, then just hold up a little longer because somehow there's even more evidence pointing at it being Dreamland. We'll be sticking to Skypea yet again 
and this time we'll be taking a look at one of my favorite characters ideologies, NL. So I did already mention this in my God Valley theory so I'll leave the link to it in the description if you want to check it out. And so now, just like how NL kindly asks people to join his country, I'm going to kindly ask you guys to join my YouTube channel by subscribing. I'll be posting my best One Piece theory ever in about a month. Just for a heads up, it's going to be about a 2 hour long video and on top of that, I'm also going to do a face reveal video at 50k subs. So subscribe with your notifications turned on if you want to see either one of those videos when they come out. Also, if you've liked anything out of this video so far, then please leave a like on the video as well. Let's try to get it to 5,000 likes. If you did this, then truly, thank you. But anyways, back in Skypea, NL says that his ultimate intention is to have a happy return to the place called Endless Verth, or in other translations, Fairy Verth. He states that his hometown believes that Fairy Verth is where the Kami resides. Now, hold up. Which Kami is he talking about? Could he possibly be talking about the Lunarians, or maybe even the God of the Sun? It surely does seem like it, especially when you take a look at what he says next. So, NL says that the Endless Verth is a land that stretches farther than the eye can see. He then says that that's the paradise he seeks, a place worthy for him, since he believes that he's a god himself. Now, when we see that NL goes to the moon, we find out that he believed the moon was actually the Endless Verth. But what if I told you that this is not true at all, and that Endless Verth was actually the ancient kingdom? The reason I believe this is because first of all, what does Endless Verth even mean? Well, if you take a look at what Gonfall described Verth to be, it's pretty much the soil that's worshipped in the sky for its ability to naturally grow plants. So, if Verth is just the sky people's word for Earth, then would an endless Verth be an endless amount of Earth? Doesn't that itself prove that the moon can't be the endless Verth since the moon doesn't have any soil? And so, what island is also described to be an endless amount of Earth? Well, if you take a look at what Professor Clover says when describing the ancient kingdom, he states that it was an immense kingdom. If it was immense, then we could only assume that it covered an immense amount of land, possibly even being so large to where it reaches further than the eye can see. Also, when NL speaks about the Endless Vert, you can clearly see that the land which is drawn behind him is green and being illuminated by a rising sun. Could this be hinting that this land was connected to the sun god and to the dawn of the world? I surely think so. I mean, it almost seems like too much of a coincidence to not be true. This also basically proves that the moon isn't the Endless Vert since the moon doesn't have any greenery around it. I explained in my God Valley video that NL thought the moon was the endless verth because the place which he's from, which is called Burka, worshipped the moon or knew about moon gods since Burka is also the name of the city on the moon. There's a lot more to this so check out that video later if you want to see the whole theory but in this video let's try to stay focused on the ancient kingdom topic. Okay, so now that I've showed you that endless verth is a place that's referred as endless or immense, a place connected to the dawn or the sun god and a legendary island that resides on the blue sea which are all paralleled with the description of the ancient kingdom now you may be wondering well yeah maybe nl was talking about the ancient kingdom but what does it have to do with necrara and the island of dreams well the way it's connected to that is because it's also literally called dream world or a world of dreams yeah no joke nami calls it that when she says that she'll go with nl on his arc maxim of course dream world is a little different from dreamland however the japanese translations to english probably meant for them to mean these same exact things. So it truly does seem like the name of the ancient kingdom was Nakrara. And now let me tell you what this all has to do with the revolutionary army. So this all has to do with the revolutionaries because just like how I said earlier, Vegapunk and Clover stated that you could learn all of this information from ancient manuscripts and what's arguably the most obvious ancient manuscript in all of One Piece. Well, it'd be Kuma's Bible. In the real world, the Bible is one of the most important ancient texts in the world since it's the most popular religion in the world so wouldn't it just make sense that it's also one of the most important ancient texts in the one piece world i mean it seems to be directly linked to the ancient kingdom itself since on the cover of the book we can clearly see a sun clouds wings that resemble the sky people's wings and a woman who seems to be wearing an ancient style of clothing i think the sun is a reference to the one piece bible being the story of the sun god and the sky peer references prove that it's at least somewhat connected to the ancient history i mean at the very least the bible should at least hold the answers to the noah the adam tree the eve tree devil fruits the angels and fallen angels and even to heaven's gate and skypea as a whole i personally also really believe jesus 
Jesus is replaced as Nika the Sun God in the One Piece Bible since Nika somewhat resembles Jesus' description in the real Bible. Jesus is described as having white wool hair and guess who else also has that? That's right, Nika. Jesus is also described as having eyes like a flame of fire and guess who else also has those type of eyes? That's right, Nika, since his eyes become red in Gear 5. Remember, when Vegapunk sees Luffy, he says that he looks just like a god who only appears in the oldest of texts. And what if the ancient text that he saw Nika was from the Bible? If this is all true, that would make Kuma one of the most interesting characters in One Piece. It'd also all explain why he's Dragon's close friend, and it could even explain how Dragon learned about Nika as well. Now, if you still don't think Nika was in the One Piece Bible, then take a look at this. The name Nika itself also seems to be connected to the Bible and to Jesus. This next part of the theory is absolutely insane, so please just bear with me. Okay, so if Nika replaces Jesus in the One Piece Bible, there has to be some evidence for it right? In fact, what do you think the name Nika was inspired from? Well, if we take a look at the Greek Jesus cross, we see that it literally has the word Nika on it. I mean, you literally can't make this stuff up. Like, what if Oda based at least some of Nika off of Jesus? I mean, who knows? He may have even based his name off of this Greek term. And when you see what these letters actually mean, it all just makes too much sense. So, the first letters on this cross are the initials for Jesus Christ, and the word Nika stands for conquers, and all together, it reads Jesus Christ conquers. Isn't this like how the sun god Nika conquers all of his enemies? Kind of like conquers hockey? And how Luffy needs to conquer his opponents to become Pirate King? I mean, Kaido did specifically tell us that hockey alone can transcend all. Another thing is that Jesus is also titled the King of Kings in the Bible, kind of like how Joy Boy is the King of the Pirates in the One Piece world. Also, more evidence on Nika being a name connected to Jesus is if you take a look at what the name means in a bunch of languages it always ties back to Jesus. The Latin meaning for Nika is belonging to the Lord, and more specifically, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because the people who spoke the Latin language were majority Christians or Catholics. The Slavic meaning is belongs to God. The Russian meaning is born on Sunday. Yes, Sunday, spelled as sun, day, which means it's the day of the sun, kind of like the sun god Nika, and it's also the day where believers of Jesus worship. In Japanese, ni means sun and ka means flower, which is kind of like the flower flower fruit user Nico Robin. I mean, she is the one who's gonna uncover the truth of the sun god and if you take a look at her name, it also has an encoded meaning. Nico means victory and Robin means bright fame, which describes the sun. So all in all, her name basically translates to the victory of the bright fame or the victory of the sun. I mean, when she accomplishes her dream of finding the Ryo Poneglyph at Laugh Tale, Luffy will have had his victory over Emu and the world and therefore Robin is a key factor to the victory of the sun. Is it also a coincidence that Robin was called All? Miss Sunday. I don't think so when you consider that she's gonna be the one to solve the mystery of Nika. Also, yet again, Oda is tying the sun and Jesus with One Piece since Robin's name can be translated as the victory of the sun and since her other name is Miss Sunday which is a day of the sun and a day connected to Jesus. I really don't think it's coincidence that he put both of these names with Robin. Also, just like how Nika the sun god is the warrior of freedom, Jesus is also known to symbolize freedom since he frees people from their sins. I mean, Jesus even says in Luke 4.18, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice how twice we see Jesus was sent to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to set the oppressed free in the story of the Bible. I mean, isn't this literally what Luffy does? Doesn't Luffy set the oppressed free? in Skypiea, in Wano, in Dress Rosa, in Sabaody, in Arlong, and so on. Doesn't Luffy literally proclaim freedom for the prisoners when he frees the prisoners of Impel Down? It all seems like too good to just be considered as a coincidence, doesn't it now? Also, just like how Jesus died on the cross only to come back to save the world in a revelation, isn't this exactly like how Joy Boy died only for the return of him to come back 800 years later? I mean, just like how the real Bible has the book of revelations which takes place in the future, the One Piece Bible also most likely has this type of ending, and proof of this is when we see everyone who learned the One Piece talk about how something in the future will happen and how Joy Boy will return. For example, Whitebeard, Roger, and O 
Odin talk about future events and it seems like they learned this intel at Laugh Tale. We also see other people that are connected to the Void Sentry looking forward to a future event, like when we see Togi came searching for the day that the war is overturned. We also see the Sea Kings bring up how they've been waiting for so long for Joy Boy and Poseidon to be reborn and that surely all will go well this time. Now this next person isn't necessarily from the Void Sentry but we all know how connected the Fishman Rays is to the Void Sentry and it seems like this legend was passed down from the people of the ancient kingdom. So Queen Otohime of Fishman Island brings up that ancient records of Fishman Island say that every few centuries Poseidon is born. She then says that the records also say that when Poseidon is born someone will appear with the power to guide her and this man is hinted to be Joy Boy or more specifically Luffy. After this she says that when that time comes when Luffy guides Shirahoshi to use her true ability a great change will come upon the world. This is most likely the same change that will appear when the world is overturned. Also if Fishman Island wrote about these things in the records then we could only assume that the ancient people wrote about them in other records as well. Another record that could hold this information could definitely be the bible and isn't the bible already confirmed to be connected to Fishman Island since the Noah and Eve tree are direct references from it. If the bible does hold a revelation story just like how the real bible does then we could only assume that it holds the truth about what will happen to the world when Joy Boy returns. To simply put it, the bible might literally tell the entire story of the ancient kingdom, the void century, and of the future events of Luffy just like how the One Piece does. It basically is the One Piece without the physical treasure that's on Laugh Tale. And if Kuma and Dragon really read and studied this ancient manuscript, they themselves pretty much solved the One Piece and the Tale of Laughter that Roger read at the final island. At the very least, they at least know a little about the true history. I also feel like the reason Dragon and Bart even teamed up was because they shared a common interest in freeing the world from the Celestial Dragon's reign of evil. They both most likely got these inspirations from the ancient manuscripts that they researched and from witnessing insane forms of slavery themselves. And now that I explained how the bible may be the book that taught dragon about the sun god and the ancient kingdom, now let's talk about another huge hint from dragon which has to do with the void century. So remember how at the beginning of the video I said how dragon got his tattoo after creating the revolutionary army and how it's one of the biggest hints to the void century? Well now that I explained to you how dragon already knows the information that you learn at Laugh Tale, now let me tell you how his tattoo is a representation of something else that's connected to the void century. First off, the timeline of when he received it seems to have some importance since we know that he didn't have it during Roger's execution or even during the Ohara incident. We even see that he didn't have it at the start of the revolutionary army's creation, showing that he got it after teaming up with Bard and Ivankov. So why did he get it and how could he have even got it? This really makes me think the reason he got it was because of something he learned from Kuma's bible. I'll explain exactly what this thing is and how it's an ancient weapon in a little bit but before that let me also bring up the fact that doesn't this tattoo resemble the winged people's traditions? Wouldn't Dragon have had to go up to Skypea to have even learned about the tattoo's tradition? I mean think about it, the only other people in One Piece with face tattoos are Sky people. For example, Wiper has one, Kalgara had one, and King also has one. Knowing this it seems like it's a part of their ancient tradition and I feel like to even find out about this, Dragon would have had to go up to see the city of gold or see a Lunarian for himself. Another possible way he could have learned about these tattoos is through Kuma's bible because remember, the bible seems to have references of the sky people. If Dragon did originally learn about the sky people and about the tattoos through his book, I feel like he's still the type of guy to go the extra mile and go to the sky islands to see if what the book said was even accurate. I believe he went up to the sky and saw Shandora and noticed how they still have the ancient beliefs of worshipping a sun god. Him even going to the sky is Loki a key to the One Piece because remember, down on the blue sea, most people don't even believe that it actually exists. Like it's so rare for someone to actually go up there and find it because first off, many people who try it end up dying and secondly, there's no guarantee that you actually find an island up there. As we saw Bellamy say, the city of gold and the One Piece are fake, he basically proved that most people are completely skeptical of either one's actual existence. The only true way of figuring out if the One Piece exists is by finding another treasure which is 
is just as legendary, which is the City of Gold. This is just like how Cricket and his monkey friends realized that the Island of Dreams is real after Luffy confirmed to them that the City of Gold was real. Therefore, Dragon seeing it for himself may have made him realize that everything the Bible told him was real and true. Now, the biggest hint of the tattoo proving that Dragon knows about the One Piece would be because of what the tattoo actually represents. So, we see that Ryuma, who is most likely a samurai from the Void Century, has the same symbol as Dragon's tattoos on his clothing, and the only difference would be that instead of the square in between the marks, he has the kanji for the word dragon. Now I know what you may be thinking, just because they have the same mark, doesn't mean dragon meant for it to symbolize the word dragon. Also, dragon and Ryuma have no connection whatsoever, so the chances of him getting the symbol for the same reason that Ryuma had it is highly unlikely, right? Well, wrong. There actually is a huge connection to dragon and Ryuma, and shout out to this reddit post for finding this insane connection, and the connection would be this. Yes, that's right, Dragon was shown in the ASL flashback, stopping by Zoro's hometown to get food and possibly for other hidden reasons. This may be the connection to Ryuma since he received food from the dojo, which means he received food from Zoro's teacher, who is a Shimotsuki, which means he received food from someone that's related to Ryuma. I feel like there's a deeper reason Dragon pulled up to Shimotsuki village specifically to receive food, since he's literally the most wanted man in the world, and I feel like most people wouldn't want to help him. Knowing this, I feel like Dragon and Zoro's teacher may have been decent friends, and they definitely could have met in their younger days since they are both from the East Blue. Even if these two weren't the closest of friends, Dragon somehow has a connection to Shimotsuki Village, which is a village named after Ryuma's lineage. Whoever he knew from that village may have showed him the same symbol from Ryuma's clothing. If this is how Dragon learned about it, then I believe he asked the Shandians to put this symbol on his face to represent how an actual dragon is connected to the Sky People. I believe he knows of a dragon that is Uranus and here's why. Although I always believed that Uranus was going to have to do with Roger's egg and with a dragon, something that I didn't know before that really hints to this being true is something that Dak Sake pointed out in his Uranus theory, which is the fact that Shiki told Roger two years before Roger became Pirate King that he knows that Roger knows the location of an ancient weapon. Since Shirahoshi wasn't born yet, it seems impossible for Poseidon to be the one he was talking about, which means he could have been only talking about Pluton or Uranus, and it doesn't seem likely that it was Pluton because I find it really unlikely that Roger found the hidden Poneglyph in Alabasta and read it on top of that. He also didn't have Odin at this point, so yet again, it doesn't seem likely that he would know where Pluton is. If anything, him knowing where Uranus is would make the most sense since he had some random egg on his crew and the mere size of this egg had to belong to some sort of monstrous creature. Also, have you ever thought about how there's so many references to dragons in One Piece? For example, Celestial Dragons, the dragon that the world nobles supposedly liked in Punk Hazard, the mysterious character named Dragon, and even dragon fruits like Kaido's and Momo's. Like, how in a fantasy world like One Piece have we not seen one single real dragon before? I mean, there's even such things like sea kings, giants, fairies, and angels, but for some reason, there isn't a single pure dragon. The dragons on Punk Hazard also don't really count because they were manufactured by Vegapunk and weren't natural beings. I wonder if dragons were wiped out sometime during the Void Century, just like how the Lunarians were erased from history. Places like Fishman Island and Shandora seem to actually prove the existence of dragons within their temples or ancient cities, since in Fishman Island, we see that Ryugu Palace, which is named after a dragon, literally has a dragon around it. In Skypea, we see that Shandora had Quetzalcoatl heads, which is a feathered serpent dragon in Mayan and Aztec culture. What if Uranus literally was Quetzalcoatl, a feathered serpent dragon, or someone who commands a bunch of these feathered serpents in the same way that Poseidon commands the Sea Kings? That's another thing too actually. If Poseidon, the Sea God, commands the Sea Kings, then wouldn't it just make sense that Uranus, who's the Sky God in Greek mythology, commands the Sky Kings or dragons? And maybe that's why the winged race had little dragon stones in their gold city. Now, one of the biggest hints to dragons being connected with Uranus and the Void Century has to do with the other two ancient weapons, Pluton and Poseidon. The correlation with these other ancient weapons is the fact that they both seem to have three things in common, a ship, a sort of gargantuan animal, and a human. Poseidon is Shirahoshi, who commands the Sea Kings, and then who tows the Noah. Pluton is a ship that seems to be waiting to be awakened by Zunisha, destroying Wano's borders, who will be commanded by Momo. Now, knowing this, we could only assume that Uranus will also have something to do with the giant ship or giant transporter, a giant animal, and a humanoid being. 
2018. Now, in this video, I'm not going to go over who I think the person and what I think the ship could be. However, I am going to tell you that I believe the giant animal is a dragon and what it has to do with the Void Century. Back in the day, Uranus may have been many dragons combined or the power of these dragons, just like how Poseidon has the power of all the sea kings. I also think Pluton was once probably connected to all of the Natami Narita elephants of the Void Century and not just Zunisha. And by the way, Natami Narita is the name of Zunisha's race. This name also proves that Zunisha isn't the only one of his kind and that at some point there was more than one. I believe that since his race has ties to Joy Boy and the Ancient Kingdom, the Celestial Dragons wiped out the entire race, just like how they did with the Lunarians. I also think they did this to the dragons of the time as well, just like Zunisha and the Sea Kings were probably connected to the Ancient Kingdom and to Joy Boy. The only reason the Sea Kings still exist is most likely because the Celestial Dragons couldn't wipe them out due to them living in the water. We also see how the water in One Piece affects combat, especially when they have devil fruits, and it's honestly so hard for humans to hunt the entire race of sea kings, since to do so, you'd have to go to the depths of the sea, where you have a high chance of drowning, getting lost, or getting eaten. I wonder if Kuma's Bible or if the ancient manuscripts of Ohara had records of these colossal beings existing or possibly even being wiped out. If either one of them did, then Dragon most likely solved what the Celestial Dragons did in the Void Century and how they wiped out everything connected to the Ancient Kingdom. It seems like he definitely solved this since he got a tattoo of a symbol representing dragons. Also remember that Odin says that a part of the One Piece is finding out what the three ancient weapons are and if a dragon is a part of Uranus then dragon having this tattoo proves yet again that he already solved the One Piece. Now going back to the last remnant of the dragons, I believe the current location of this dragon to actually be in Elbath and the reason for that is because Roger realized that he had to let it grow up in a land that could handle it. I mean you can't put a goddamn giant dragon in a place like Water 7 or Alabasta because it would literally destroy the whole city and on top of that, the world government would probably come after it. Like, it would need to grow up in a place in the new world and since it's a colossal creature, I feel like only the giants could raise it without being killed in the process. And of course, if the Uranus dragon is located in Elbaf, then we already know that Monkey D Dragon would probably know about it since he met Saul at Ohara. He may have gone to Elbaf to meet Saul again and to discuss more about Ohara. Is it also really a coincidence that both Shanks and Dragon, who seem to have connections with Elbaf, have dragons carved out as their ships. Knowing that Elbaf is Shanks' territory, maybe he got a dragon carved out on his ship to symbolize that he has the dragon or at least that he knows where it is. And the same thing goes for Monkey D Dragon. Another key symbol that may tie everything together is with Vegapunk. Remember how I explained that I believe Uranus will come from the egg on Roger's ship? Well, is it a coincidence that Vegapunk works on the island called Egghead? I mean, the egg part of the island doesn't look like a natural part of the land and it looks to be built by man. Maybe Vegapunk told the builders of Punk Records that he wanted it to be built in the shape of an egg and used it as a reference to show that he's also waiting for the egg to hatch and waiting for the dragon at Elbaf to become Uranus. I mean, remember, he also visited Elbaf and also has ties to dragon, so I wouldn't be surprised if he knew everything that dragon knew. And on top of this, if you think this is a stretch, then wait, because there's something in Punk Hazard that may prove he has seen the dragon for himself. So in case you forgot, in chapter 664, Brownbeard confirms that Vegapunk was the one who made the dragon at Punk Hazard and that it's an artificial life form. Now, the big question here would be, how did Vegapunk even learn how to create an artificially living dragon? Well, this is where it gets interesting. So, we later find out in Whole Cake that Vegapunk discovered the presence of bloodline elements in living things, or in other words, he found the blueprints of life. Vince Milk Judge used this research to create a clone army, and we also see that Vegapunk used it to do a similar thing. For example, it seems like he used this research to create Stussy, the Seraphim, and his six other bodies. He most likely used the DNA of human beings and Lunarians to create these beings, which means wouldn't he have had to use dragon DNA to create a dragon? And what dragon in One Piece resembles the one that we saw at Punk Hazard? Well, there isn't one. Even Kaido's and Momo's dragon forms are differently shaped than the one at Punk Hazard. With that, it doesn't seem very likely that he used Kaido's fruit to create this dragon, so we could only assume that he got DNA from a real-life dragon and then used that DNA to create his own. I believe the dragon he received this DNA from had to be from the one that I believe is Uranus and the one that I believe lives on Elbaf. Another interesting thing with this dragon is the fact that the 
Celestial Dragons gave it a name. However, Brownbeard conveniently forgot what this name was. Now, Oda did write in a Viva card that the dragon's name is Dragon 13. However, I find it really unlikely that that's the name that the Celestial Dragons chose to give it. I mean, doesn't that sound more like some scientific name that Vegapunk would give it? For example, maybe he called it Dragon 13 because it was his 13th try at creating a dragon or the 13th dragon that he created. We also do know that he in fact made more than one dragon when we see that he made another one that also still lives on Punk Hazard. So Dragon 13, receiving his name that way would make sense. I find this to make more sense than the Celestial Dragons giving it this name, which puts up the question, what could the name that the Celestial Dragons gave it even be? Well, what if they called it something like Uranus or something hinting to the ancient weapon? I also wonder why they really loved it and I hope we eventually find out the answers to these questions. I feel like this will have something to do with why they call themselves Celestial Dragons. Also, Vegapunk seems to have some sort of obsession over dragons since we also know that the only fruit that he recreated was the Zoan Dragon fruit. Like, why didn't he want to recreate any other fruit but this one? I believe his research on these mythical beings has something to do with the one I believe is on Elbaf. Now, going back to Monkey D. Dragon, I also believe Dragon's tattoo, Saiyan Dragon, is a diss to the world government, basically telling them that he knows where the ancient weapon is and also that he knows about them being wiped out during the Void Century. I feel like he's basically telling the High Celestial Dragons, I know what you guys did and I know who the true gods of the world are. He doesn't only do this with Uranus, but he also does it with his Jolly Roger, which seems to have an ancient Oars giant phase and Lunarian wings. Both of these races also seem to be erased from history and one of them were even the gods who once lived on Marijua, while the Oars giants seem to be very connected with the ancient kingdom. Like, you guys already know how I always say Oars is Joy Boy, and the fact that Dragon's Flag has Oars' face on it may prove it. Now, I know that a lot of people claim that this is actually meant to be a dragon and not Oars, but the reason I argue it's not a dragon is because the face structure looks almost nothing like a dragon. If we take a look at all the dragons in One Piece, none of them resemble Dragon's Flag. On the other hand, the Oars race looks exactly like his flag, with the bottom jaw being much larger than the top part of his mouth. Now, to how Dragon learned about the Oars race, I'm gonna warn you, be prepared to be mind blown because it somehow all connects with everything that I've been saying throughout the video. So, he may have learned about the importance of the Oars race through the ancient texts and on his trip to Skypea. I mean, Robin, an archaeologist, was the only one who heard of Oars' name through his legend of being the continent pooler, and I actually don't think she was talking about the Oars in Thriller Bark, but actually the one whose skull is known as Onigashima. The Kunihiki legend is a real Japanese legend of a continent pooler who puts together the Shaman Peninsula, and in One Piece terms, I believe the legend is associated with Onigashima or Oars the First putting Wano together. If you want to see the origins of this theory, then go check out the Reddit post of the man who created it. Now, if Robin heard of this legend through her archaeology, then maybe Dragon also heard of it in a similar way, which is by the books of Ohara. If he went to Skypea, he may have connected more dots since there's vert statues in the shape of Oars, and since the Shandians have Oars masks. Yeah, Remember this ancient statue that I brought up earlier in the video? Well, if you take a close look at it, it perfectly resembles Oars. Like, why would the Shandians have a bunch of these statues laid out throughout Upper Yard? And why would they also have Oars masks? Well, I believe that these are traditions and statues from the Void Century that were created to honor the previous Joy Boy. Remember that these are the same dudes who worshipped the Sun God even 400 years after the Void Century happened. Also, is it really a coincidence that the first time we see these Oars statues, Sanji calls it a pagan idol. In another translation, he calls it a religious figure and this seems to be the most insane foreshadow by Oda, literally telling us that this figure is a statue of the sun god Nika. The Shandian signs of God also seem to be trying to symbolize Oars or an Oni with their horned skulls. On top of this, Dragon may have even connected more dots if Vegabunk told him about the ancient kingdom's ancient Oars giant robot that's fueled by an unknown energy. Yet again, another huge piece of the Void Century has something to do with Oars. After learning all of this, Dragon may have learned about the Oars race's true importance and may have used his flag and tattoo as a symbol to the celestial dragons that he knows they are not the true gods of the world because the sun god, Lunarians, and dragons are the true gods. He may be telling them that although they erased their races from history, he still learned of their importance and about the fear that the world nobles feel from them. They honestly probably wiped out all of these races specifically because of their insane amount of strength and power. These creatures and beings were probably their biggest threats. Dragon having Oars' 
Ors' flag is also the perfect symbol if Ors is in fact the original sun god Nika, since it perfectly describes what he's trying to do to the world. He's trying to liberate and free the world just like Nika, and as I stated before, Nika is most likely his biggest inspiration. Nika being his symbol also perfectly coincides with his introduction, since these things cannot be stopped an inherited strength of will, one's dreams, the ebb and flow of the ages, as long as people hunger for freedom, these things will exist. With this, I absolutely cannot wait for him to meet Luffy because I want to see his opinion on the real war of liberation. I also can't wait to see them fight the celestial dragons together and he also seems to like his son since he's happy that he ended up becoming a pirate. Also, have you ever noticed that Luffy is the key to the One Piece? Some hints to this could be that he has an X on his chest, possibly foreshadowing that he's the key to the One Piece treasure since everyone knows that X marks the spot. Also, could the X on his chest maybe symbolize treasure chest? Another thing is that Luffy claims that the straw head is his treasure, which could possibly be foreshadowing that Luffy is the One Piece treasure since his nickname is Straw Hat or Mugiwara. Maybe Straw Hat will be the treasure, just like how he claimed Straw Hat is his treasure. There's a whole lot more to this theory of Luffy being the key to the One Piece and click on this video right here if you want to see it. Lastly, please make sure to check out Wonder, the link is in the description, and I'll see you guys in the next one.